Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to uh, day two of this Moon Village workshop. Uh, apologies to those people out on the internet who may be watching a, a, an empty lecture theatre to start with, but we're all here now. Uh, we're about to kick off today's proceedings. Uh, first to talk is John Mankins, who's going to summarise uh, the output uh, uh, and uh, action yesterday in the breakout sessions. John. Please. So I will ask you to all um, have, since they're not up here, I can't show them very quickly in the time is very short. So I will ask you to make reference to the slides uh, that should be in your breakout rooms when you get to that point. So yesterday, of course, we had the, um, the first round of breakout sessions. I know some of them went fairly well. I know some of them went really chaotically. Uh, let me reassure you that that's a fine thing. Uh, because six months ago, this organization did not exist. A week ago, this organization was not actually legally chartered. And this is the very first workshop and meeting. Uh, one suggestion, uh, I don't know if she's here this morning yet. Yes, Kate Harkless, Kate Harkless Gray made a very good suggestion for a way to improve the meeting. Uh, and that was to um, uh, perhaps give the individual groups uh, some more targeted focus. Uh, I have to say that today we're not going to try to do that. We're going to stay to the plan that we have already laid out. However, one thing that I would like to ask all of you to do when you get into your breakout uh, sessions, and I'm speaking uh, in particular to the rapporteurs, uh, the student volunteers to help to make this happen, is uh, to please provide information about what uh, topics that we are discussing yesterday and today that are of interest to you. And then, for example, then at the next meeting, we'll inform you and it, you'll get invited. And we will uh, have that information and use it to construct uh, more focused breakout groups that you can participate in that are related to some of the topics that you identify. Please don't identify just one, unless you really are only interested in one thing. Uh, but if you identify uh, several topics, then we can use that information for future uh, workshop planning to better uh, use your uh, interests and your uh, subject matter expertise. Secondly, uh, I would like to remind all of the rapporteurs who are here uh, that uh, you have the thumb drives. So all of the rapporteurs, if, if the technical participants haven't seen this yet, all of them have thumb drives onto which all of the ITPCs that are generated yesterday and today uh, are supposed to go by the end of this afternoon's meeting. Uh, and that's so that all that information can get aggregated most conveniently. Uh, and so I would just ask all of them to please make sure that that happens and all of you to please contribute to that. Uh, and uh, for the rapporteurs to please give me those thumb drives uh, by the end of today's meeting. So this afternoon when we finish the plenary, uh, to please uh, uh, see me and, and give those back to me. Um, with that, I will just make one more little quick announcement, and that is to remind you that the uh, discussions today are intended to focus uh, when we get them started, which will be around uh, 11, they are intended to focus on the missions and markets associated with the Moon Village opportunity, i.e. cis lunar space missions and markets, uh, including the surface of the moon. However, I know a lot of the discussions yesterday concerning capabilities and uh, the technical framework for the Moon Village did not get to closure. <clears throat> only the first two hours, and the first two hours was split into two pieces, and the first half of the first two hours, a lot of that was introductions and, and getting started. 
So please do remember that today's discussion should be missions and markets for the Moon Village concept and the technical framework. And then we'll do the wrap, we'll, we'll get back to, we won't get back together again after this morning's uh, plenary session breaks up in a couple of hours until this afternoon. Um, so please keep this in mind. And then the last session uh, at the end of this app today, the breakout session is to be uh, coordination and cooperation topics, i.e. how do we stitch this together uh, in the absence of a massive global project um, and the cultural impacts and cultural opportunities associated with the Moon Village, but also missions and markets and also the technical framework. So by the end of today, we should have had uh, four uh, good hours of discussion today, plus the two hours yesterday, uh, and have a really strong uh, product uh, for the workshop. For this first workshop. Uh, let me ask, are there any questions concerning the breakout activities that we'll be having later today? Yes. Yes. So the So then the easy answer is yes. And I'm looking forward to doing that during the next couple of weeks. <laughs> but we're not going to try to do it here. Uh, to, to, to do that kind of integration on the fly in a meeting like this would require us to have one additional full day. It would require some, it, it's, it's too much to ask. So, but it'll, it will be taken care of and then there will, but we will not lose track of where the two different threads came from or two or three or four different threads came from when we put them together into an, an integrated ITDC. Dallas, did you? Okay, very good. So, uh, any other questions before we turn back to the program and uh, in particular, um, a discussion on uh, Chinese data leasing policy. Any other no que question? Okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> I wonder if we should maybe take some time towards the end to have some, since we are all here today, to have some discussion about what should be the next steps for the Moon Village Association in it's the on, next six it, months. It is, in fact, on the agenda. Um, uh, and so, so, yes, we certainly should. Uh, and I will just I will just remind you that one of the uh, the requests from the uh, in the template that's on the, the for the working groups, thank you for the reminder, Angeliki, is in fact to ask you for your thoughts in the individual breakout sessions on uh, what should we be doing in the near term, what should we be thinking about doing uh, this afternoon when we call for your um, reports from the, the different working groups. That's one of the topics that we certainly want to get started in the discussion. So absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Oh, uh, one more reminder, sorry. Don't forget rapporteurs, take pictures of your groups. We want to be able to include in our, our um, uh, final report pictures of all of us working, uh, not necessarily happily, but at least <laughs> diligently. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, uh, sorry to, to rush into some new information and uh, I take this. I hope I can make it within five minutes and to make a short introduction about the China Lula Exploration Program for the data uh, publishing and information system. So this is the this is the website. Sorry, this is the this is the website. From from this one, you can see this is the interface in Chinese and English, and. Uh, uh, from here, you can see a lot of information about the Lolo program. For example, this is the uh, four moon pictures and uh, something like the uh, 3D pictures and with uh, very high resolution. And uh, also like the, this is the, the kind of uh, material distribution on the moon. And uh, some 
and like the temperature, uh, and lunar brightness temperature mapping, and uh, all everything here is available on site with the open and free access. And uh, if you want, you can log into this system, and uh, you have uh, all the data for the different programs and uh, pictures. All together, it's about uh, um, two uh, terabytes uh, for the data itself. And uh, you also, there is a place, and from here you can uh, log in. And all the data is uh, um, published according to the NASA standard. So it's easy for you to get access and read it and do some analysis based on it. That's it. Yeah, 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 I could do it afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's Well, I'm Mike Simpson. I'm uh, an advisory committee member for the Moon Village Association and executive director of Pure World Foundation, former president here and uh, feels good to be home. Uh, I get the uh, privilege this morning of uh, chairing the uh, session on science, technology, and, and culture. And we will open, uh, as was our format yesterday, with uh, several presentations and then we'll arrange uh, a panel down here uh, to uh, converse a little bit with each other about what they've had to say, but also uh, to open up for uh, some questions from uh, all of you. Uh, if you have your program, uh, you'll see that we uh, were expecting a, a remote uh, presentation this morning, but that has uh, not been able to uh, occur. And so we will move uh, immediately to our uh, first speaker, uh, Dr. Um, Mahesh Anand. And, uh, uh, all of these people have distinguished biographies that could cut into their time, but let me just say that uh, Dr. Anand is a reader in planetary science and exploration at the Open University in the UK and currently coordinates the UK node of the NASA Solar System uh, Exploration Research Virtual Institute. That sounds like a lot of stuff to do in one set of words, so um, you're on. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, everyone, for showing up this morning. I wasn't expected to be the first one up, but uh, um, always good to get things uh, going. So I'm here uh, to, to represent the European Space Sciences Committee. Um, but some of the things that I will present, obviously, will be colored by my own expertise and experience in working in the field of lunar science for the last 20 years. And in fact, when the invitation from uh, Moon Village Association came to ESSC, um, an email went around saying if anybody wanted to volunteer, it seemed to me like, okay, uh, it's about time that I actually step up to the plate. So um, I, I just want to do a disclaimer that if I give you any information that turned out to be not your liking, it's my own personal opinion, but if you like something that is ESSCs, okay? So, uh, we are here to talk about the moon. Uh, I have been uh, quite struck actually, because as I said, I have been active in this field for the last 20 years, and I know quite a lot of uh, people who are active in lunar exploration and science field. But I have to admit that apart from one or two people here, I didn't recognize any other person. And that was fantastic, because that told me that actually I didn't know a large community that I needed to reach out and get to know. So I have already actually got something out of this workshop, and hopefully I will give you something that you will benefit uh, in the coming month. So let's move on. So why do we think that Moon is actually a keystone for understanding the formation and evolution of the solar system? So we haven't heard much about the 
science actually that is about the moon or that can be done from the moon in the past day or so. So I hope you won't get too bored if I talk a bit about lunar science because in my opinion that is what going to underpin anything that gets done on the moon. So all the brilliant ideas that we have about using lunar resources and using water, extracting water, etc., can only be properly realized if you actually fully understand the science uh, behind those things, the science of the material that exists on the moon. So let's review what we already uh, know about it. So uh, if So I think I should also tell you what actually ESSC is about. So it's actually an independent, unbiased expert panel of a, a group of scientists from across uh, Europe. Uh, we are about 32 uh, members plus the chair, and we are all drawn out from different disciplines of space sciences and from different, different um, countries. In, in Europe, uh, we provide uh, expert advice. Uh, we um, uh, do consultations for various European Union programs. Uh, we uh, sit in the uh, Council uh, of Ministerial for ESA um, as an observer, and we have various other involvement with lots of international bodies and uh, space agencies, etc. So I think that should give you, uh, you know, a, a pretty good. Um, idea as to um, uh, where we have opportunity to provide input. And, and that way, I think we play a, a very important uh, role. So, ESSC is all about space science. And moon is a very, very tiny bit there, right? But we are here to talk about the moon. So let's focus the rest of the talk about the moon. So um, if, uh, I'm sure this is not a controversial statement, uh, changing views of the moon, both in the sky as well as metaphorically, that's what is going on. You know, the moon, to me, is the easiest object that you can relate to somebody. You can engage almost everybody in the world in discussion about the moon, whether it's uh, uh, about its presence in folklore or in the society, you know, culture, you know, you, you, you go to India, China, a anywhere. Moon is always there in their stories. And then you can start your discussion there and then you can drive it the way you like it. I like to drive it towards lunar science. You can drive it whatever your interest is. So we have come to realize in recent times, especially in the last five years or so, that there is actually an increasing desire to return to the moon, so to speak, because we always say, well, we have been there, right? 45 years ago. So a lot of people ask the question why we are going back. And we always say, Let's return to the moon, right? But this time we are going to return to the moon for staying there for a little longer than what we did first time. So what is the global context? You don't just want to go to the moon because, you know, you like to. Um, there must be a good reason. And I think the first uh, word sums it up, you know, all civilizations become either spacefaring or extinct. Yeah, I think you would agree with that. And I think that is, is kind of supported by all the global initiatives that have come out. You know, there is a, there is a real international effort in uh, returning to the moon or for many actually going for the first time. Yeah? Because people are interested. People are interested in knowing more about the moon, going to find out what else they can find on the moon. Actually, that can be of use not just for their daily use, but also how it can actually support the further exploration of the solar system. And you know, there are a list of things there that you can read, but you know, a couple of things to highlight is, uh, for the purposes of discussion that's happening here, is the in-situ resource utilization, which I think seems to be the uh, main, main driver. But don't forget that actually there is a tremendous amount of science that can also be done. And of course, you heard from the ESA DG that the moon can also be a training ground, you know, for training astronauts for exploration of the further reaches of the solar system, be it Mars or wherever. Now, let's, you know, hone in to the European context because uh, it's important right now we are in Europe and actually uh, whether we realize or not, actually there is a large amount of lunar activity going on in Europe. So. And I'm here 
on behalf of ESSC. So it's uh, only appropriate that I, uh, I summarize what is Europe's view, okay? And at the top is the official statement from ESSC, um, a statement that they provided to the Council of Ministers um, at ESA meeting last year. And this is where the money uh, gets committed. Yeah? If European states don't commit to some of these programs, well, we can't do much. Okay? And we were extremely successful because you heard about this uh, exploration envelope program that ESA has brought out and not actually, in, in my opinion personally, that actually it gives us flexibility to operate a solar system exploration plan with a lot of flexibility. So you don't focus on an object, but you actually use an object to get to your ultimate destination. So if you have to use ISS to get to the moon or you have to use the moon to test some things to go to Mars, etc., it should all be part of one single theme. But you should have flexibility to actually, you know, act accordingly. So what I want to do in the few next few slides is to show you that we do have a very rich history of lunar science uh, in Europe. And hopefully you will take a few of those. Um, so I personally, I work on the Apollo samples and lunar samples that were brought back in 1960s and 70s. And to me, the Apollo program was one of the best examples of how something like that could actually foster technological innovation and training for a large cohort of scientists and engineers for which you reap the benefit, even you are reaping the benefit today. So I was not born even those, when those missions took place, but I'm the one who is actually working on those samples, okay? So thanks to NASA for that, but see what the Apollo and Luna program did for the next 50 years, okay? And outside of the USA, the largest lunar science community actually exists in Europe. I don't think that's a very widely known fact, okay? But that is the case. So what, what, what did those um, Apollo and Luna programs, and particularly the Apollo program, actually do for us? Well, first of all, if you actually are a geologist, you would like to visit your field site. Because more than half of the information that you are going to require to, to interpret from the samples that you collect is going to come from the field context, means knowing where your samples are coming from. Yeah. So before we actually talk about how much water there is on the moon and in what form it is, I would like to actually see it, feel it, and actually collect the sample in which the water is there. Until I see that, I'm not convinced that we yet know that there is indeed water present on the moon. So ask yourself a question, where have you seen the evidence? Okay. So I think we need to be a bit more, uh, you know, careful in our interpretation. But you do realize that these are only a um, few locations where Apollo missions uh, went, and Moon is much bigger than that. So we haven't actually seen much of the Moon. But what have you learned? You know, you can ask, okay, you can go and do your field work. What are you going to get out of it? Well. One of the biggest things that we learned by getting the Apollo samples back in the lab is to get uh, an insight into how the moon formed. And using that, we can even find out how the Earth formed because the Earth-Moon is a system. Okay? Even till today, papers are being published in, you know, regularly. If you just look at the last year, you might find more than 10 or 20 papers on the lunar topic published in journals like Nature and Science from the work that has been carried out on Apollo samples. I mean, that's phenomenal, okay? We are still learning about how planets form, how the moon formed, and how it can be used as an example for understanding planet formation in the solar system. We also understand how actually then, once the planets have formed, what happens to them? How do they differentiate? And the concept of uh, magma ocean actually came from the moon, from the studies of lunar rock. You know, you can, you can see that example. The moon is a relatively simple place and actually you, you, hypoth you, you make some hypotheses and actually you can test it relatively easily on, on the moon and then you can apply it elsewhere. So all that was going on for the last 40 plus years and all of a sudden, you know, about 10 years ago, this new information came about, so it's the water on the moon, okay? 
it was not that people didn't suspect water on the moon. They did. But 40 years ago, the technology wasn't there to actually detect things at a level that we are able to do now. And, and this paper that came out in 2009 in Science by Peter Sattal on the Chandrayaan-1 data demonstrated that actually maybe there is some evidence for water present at higher latitude um, and near the lunar poles. But remember that this was all based on remote sensing data. And it is only detecting that, you know, getting signal from the top millimeter of the surface. So although this is extremely exciting, what we needed to do is then to go back and actually confirm that whether indeed that was the case. And you might have heard about, you know, um, this uh, impact mission called LCROSS mission, which um, sent uh, an impactor into a polar location on the moon. Remember one location, one shot. The plume that came out did give some evidence that there was components of water present in the plume, which means that water could be present in those areas. So I think things were going in the right direction, but up until that point, if that was the case, then we should be seeing the same thing in the actual lunar samples that we have in the lab, right? So if you see something on the lunar surface and if you have material from there, why don't we actually see that same thing? We did. Right? So we did. We, we had it, but not in the form of free-flowing water or ice or anything like that. But remember that 40 plus years ago, we couldn't detect the amount of water that we are able to detect now in the lunar samples. But of course, when we actually uh, now reanalyze those samples using modern day instrumentation, yeah, some of the work that is being uh, carried out at the Open University, we were able to actually demonstrate that there is water present not just on the surface of the moon, but most likely throughout the lunar interior. The next question is, where are these different water reservoirs have come from? They don't have to be from the same source. And that's what we are trying to understand. So it may be that actually water in the interior of the moon came about when the moon actually formed, or soon after it has formed. But as water that we are seeing from remote sensing measurement, could be water delivered in its recent geological history. Yeah? And there could be a spectrum between the two. And we need to actually resolve that in order to get a better idea as to how much of that water is available as a resource. And if that water is present either as a free water ice or inside minerals, what kind of technical technological development you will need to extract that water? Yeah? You need to consider the temperatures that are present at the lunar surface. Is your machine going to operate in those temperature levels? Okay, so there are many things that remain unresolved, and it's just a picture of a beautiful Apollo sample that I can um, showing you. So, the future exploration of the moon. We are going to go there. Of course, we are going to be driven by the, um, the chance of finding resources. Um, so we, two minutes, yeah, I should be finished. Um, we want to explore places that we have not um, explored before, which means going towards the polar regions, exploring the far side. So I'm really looking forward to Changi 4 that's going to land on the far side in a couple of years' time. And then you have heard about Deep Space Gateway and other various. Well, I think uh, one thing we can be certain about humanity is that we do have ambition. So yeah, why not be a bit more ambitious? So you go to distant objects to, to stay, to, to make use of what is present there. This is what is known as ISRU, and I have no doubt that we are moving in that direction. And maybe Moon Village Association could be one of those vehicles, right? We can move. So I think I, I, in, in summary, I hope that uh, you got the message that uh, at least with respect to ESSC, that has to look after everything in space science. They are fully aware of these new development in the uh, lunar uh, field. Um, they, they expect that these, these new uh, uh, development would allow a more synergistic approach through the ESAS E3P program and Space 4 program than it was possible before. And finally, I would like to draw to your attention that if you're not aware, then as I said, I didn't know a community existed. You probably don't know that another community exists. So there will be a sixth 
European Lunar Symposium that will take place in Toulouse uh, next May. Um, the number six itself suggests to you that this is the sixth time we are doing it. And it's a place where everybody who is working on the moon across Europe plus around the world, they come together. So if you are interested, uh, you should come to it. And in the next week or so, uh, we should be opening up the abstract submission and more announcement going. So I'm happy to take any questions or if I have run out of my time, then I'm happy to stop here. Thank you. People hold questions until we get the uh, panel all together, and that way we'll be able to sort of uh, stay a little bit closer to uh, schedule. Our second speaker, <coughs> <coughs> our second speaker today, uh, Dr. Oleg Vinskowski, um, basically has university and PhD diplomas from the Kiev Polytechnic Institute. Uh, his basic area of uh, expertise is automatic control of complex technological processes. He's also a wonderful colleague. Please uh, come and enjoy uh, uh, Oleg's uh, talk. Good morning, everybody. Uh, you are destined to survive another technical presentation before being immersed in the artistic world, as far as I understand by the next speaker. So, uh, what I'm going to speak about is lunar and industry, lunar industry and research base, as we call it at Yuzhne. For your understanding, uh, we came up with these ideas uh, quite a few time ago. Uh, but made them public uh, just one week after the official announcement by Jan Werner of uh, the Moon Village. Still, you will see that uh, there are many similarities in our views. That's why um, I would strongly recommend uh, to my company's bosses to join the MBA after I am back in Ukraine. Thank you. Here is an outline. I'm going to speak a little bit about a Yuzhne heritage, which is very rich uh, with regard to the moon. Uh, I will explain our vision of the strategy of the lunar base creation. Uh, we'll uh, give you some example of the so-called enabling technologies, uh, which uh, we are working on at Yuzhne and which we believe the creators of the moon base should uh, take into account. This concerns uh, mainly space transportation system, but also um, lunar-based infrastructure, lunar orbital elements, and I will uh, speak a little bit about international cooperation time permitting. So, uh, during the so-called uh, first moon race, let me call it like this, uh, the Soviet Union was uh, working on the famous, or rather infamous, because it was never implemented, N1 lunar uh, launch system. And my company, uh, Yuzhne Design Office, was in charge of the so-called uh, Block E, which is seen here in the uh, lunar uh, space vehicle. Uh, the idea was that this block should provide for smooth landing of two uh, crew, uh, two person crew, and uh, take off as well as smooth as possible to the uh, back to the lunar orbit. In order to provide this, we have developed and uh, created two engines. One is the main. Uh, with the thrust, uh, with deep throttling from 858 uh, eight kilogram to uh, a little bit more than two ton. And another one is a backup. Needless to say, since we are talking in terms of uh, human life, uh, we should provide a high reliability of, of the system. And uh, there were very good parameters in terms of uh, ISP for both uh, uh, engines. And uh, there were multiple um, tests done, including three 
in orbit. Not the lunar orbit, but the Earth orbit. Still, it was done in space three times. So please bear this in mind when we move forward with my presentation. We will come back. We will need this information in a few slides. Now, what's our vision of the uh, periodicity and steps of the uh, moon-based creation? First, it's a preparatory phase. We should set up an international cooperation. We should explore uh, robotically the moon surface. We should decide where we, in fact, base our uh, equipment, our people in the future. Then we should create minimal configuration probably with means delivered from the Earth at the first stage. Then we expand our base with new elements. Another stage is a starting of manufacturing things immediately on the moon surface. And the final, or let's say almost final uh, stage is a permanent base already created and uh, working at full strength. You may find um, the whole schedule a little bit, sorry, a little bit conservative. But, okay, should we uh, manage to do it faster, it only will be better. Now, space transportation system. You can see uh, on the basis of the uh, Mayak family launch vehicles, one of them, uh, the heaviest one, uh, we have uh, came up with the, we have come up with an idea of uh, the so-called Krypton uh, space transportation system, Krypton launcher, uh, capable of delivering 90, a little bit more, ton to LEO and uh, 30 ton uh, of the payload to the lunar trajectory and more than 8 ton payload on the moon surface. Uh, while uh, the launcher itself is still on the drawing board, it's a conceptual design. Also, many technologies are already there. I would like to draw your particular attention to the engines. Uh, look, uh, the overall thrust to be provided is like here. And uh, we have 15 agents, the same engines, one, uh, three in the core stage, and three uh, by four liquid boosters. If you divide this figure by 15, you will easily come up uh, with a figure of uh, roughly 251 ton of the LOX kerosene engine uh, thrust. And uh, uh, you will discover that it's comparable to the famous AR-1 engine being uh, developed by Aerojet. Uh, it's the same components, the same scheme, uh, closed cycle. But I should tell you that our engine is better, in a sense. Yes, yes, it's not a joke. In a sense that it's 25 ton more powerful, roughly. It has several um, points better ISP at the Earth's surface. And we are now more or less on a par with Aerojet in terms of the engine development. Maybe Aerojet is a little bit more advanced now because money uh, being invested are incomparable, as you may imagine. Still, uh, please bear this in mind. Uh, for the kick stage and for the second stage of the two-stage uh, uh, Krypton launcher, we propose a 50-ton thrust engine, also LOX kerosene, and also at a good stage of development. It is uh, due to this uh, kick stage that we can deliver a 30 ton to the lunar, uh, lunar orbit. Another very important development uh, for the space tag, lunar space tag, um, potentially for in-orbit servicing, is uh, this one, uh, the engine of roughly 8 ton thrust. In this case, NTO-UDMH components, but this engine is almost completely developed, 95%, I would say. We have some ideas of how uh, the manned spaceship for for a uh, strong crew could look like, and some figures are presented in this table. I do not spend much time on this. Uh, now, a landing platform. There are two options, in fact. One is a purely unmanned mission, uh, option one. Another one for the mission uh, with crew, option two, and uh, you can see some uh, mass 
characteristic here. But what is essential again is how to land and how to take off these uh, modules. And again, uh, here I invite you to recollect what I said in the beginning. And uh, we uh, have uh, developed and continue to develop a very interesting engines which provide for deep throttling uh, and uh, which could really uh, provide you a possibility to land very smoothly on the moose surface and take off whenever it is necessary. This engine is called RG860 and uh, the thrust could vary from 500 kg down uh, two times, 250 to 250 and provide this kind of um, uh, graph in terms of uh, moon thrust uh, change. Uh, essentially, it is based on the technologies already proven in space. What concerns uh, combustion chamber, automatics, uh, gas generator, uh, principally new, recent development, relatively recent development by Yuzhna is a pneumo pump. I have no time to dwell upon uh, what are the advantages of pneumo pump with regard to turbo pump or to the pressure fed systems. But believe me, there are some, I can tell you which concretely afterwards. Uh, now just uh, look what could be done on the basis of this engine. Uh, bearing in mind that we had a system uh, with two assemblies uh, for the N1 project, Soviet times, uh, we implemented the same idea of two assemblies of engines here. Look, there is one assembly engine Com, uh, com, uh, compiled by two Vega-like engines. For some of you, it could be interesting to learn that uh, Yuzhna supplies a uh, propulsion system for the upper stage of the European uh, small venture logo, uh, Vega. So it's Vega-like engines, uh, each uh, 25, uh, uh, 250 kg thrust. And in the middle is the engine I showed you on the previous slide with 500 kilograms thrust. So you can see by combining these two assemblies, we can provide even deeper throttling from one ton to 250 kilogram thrust. Let us imagine that you need to correct trajectory when approaching the moon. You need to uh, insert the spacecraft into the moon orbit. You have to maneuver in the moon orbit. For this purpose, you can uh, use combined action of two of the two assemblies. But whenever you need to land, you can, for example, either switch off this assembly and do it uh, double throttled with the central assembly, or you can, if necessary, provide even this kind of throttling. It's very high level of development technological readiness. It's number six. Now, what concerns uh, moon infrastructure? Uh, we believe, and there were a lot of talks on the standardization, we believe it makes sense to use uh, to full extent what is already available. And from this perspective, we think that uh, there should be two types, mainly two types of cylindrical types of uh, modules, horizontal and vertical one, and it is not at all by chance that you can see here three meters diameter and five meters diameter. For example, uh, we at Yuzhne mastered waffle grid structures for cyclone launchers, for example, with three meters diameter. Ariane, as you may know, has roughly five meters diameter uh, core uh, stage uh, for, for the launcher. So our suggestion is to use these technologies, at least in the beginning, to create the very basic infrastructure on the moon. Uh, this is more an entertaining part, I would say, because it's our artistic view of how gateway module or accommodation module or vivarium could uh, look like. I don't need to spend much time. Uh, the names of the modules speak for themselves. Here is also production and repair module, command module, which uh, we envisage in two parts. One is the community room on the first floor, let's say, and another one is the um, uh, working places uh, for, for the uh, crews. 
Uh, here, how science laboratory could look like, uh, and uh, we have uh, already sought out how much kilograms should we need to bring uh, to the moon surface. We will need, of course, a solar power station with roughly these characteristics mentioned in the table. And of course, Yes, I'm about to finish. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we will need a uh, remote sensing spacecraft, both radar, uh, optical, uh, or communication, and navigation. Uh, it's a must, of course. And some characteristics are also mentioned here. Lunar orbital station, uh, needless to say, it's important. And uh, we, uh, I am coming to the conclusion uh, to speak a little bit about uh, cooperation, international cooperation. Everybody understands it's a sine qua non condition uh, in order to proceed with uh, the Moon Village or whatever is a global project of this kind. There are some clear advantages. Um, my colleagues uh, pictured uh, several aspects of the, of the international cooperation. Of course, there will be public sector participating, private sector. Joint programs are already happening, as we have heard from Jan Werner, for example. It's a joint program with the United States on Orion and European service model. It's a joint pro project with Russia, etc., etc. Um, I'm a little bit, I'm personally a little bit skeptical about this part. Uh, I don't believe uh, a, a kind of multi engine agency, multinational agency is going to be created, but uh, my colleagues look uh, like this idea very much. I, I left this like this. Uh, sh should, should you have any questions, I, I am ready to uh, develop on in more details on international cooperation in the course of our panel. But here I would like to stop now. Thank you, Olaf. I think we will try to pose the questions on the panel session, but uh, we won't allow you to get away without your ideas on international cooperation. Our uh, next speaker is um, Hagen Betzwieser, who is uh, uh, a designer and artist, and whose uh, uh, whose work has included uh, an effort to look at the gaps between uh, science, aesthetics, art, uh, and will bring uh, to uh, uh, to our session today some of his insights on the work he has uh, been doing. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. I'm using this clip on the mic. That's working. Yes, no, maybe. Can you hear me? No, no, yes, yes. Okay, excellent. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Hagen Betzwieser. I'm an artist, designer, and a filmmaker, and I'm probably too loud on the microphone. Yes. Um, I'm an artist, designer, and a filmmaker, and I'm constantly shifting and mixing these disciplines in my work. Today, I want to try to talk about two things, contemporary art in post-Apollo lunar response, so this is my first seven and a half minutes, and the second seven and a half minutes is We Colonize the Moon, my artistic cooperation with Sue Cork in the UK. And I need this remote now. Uh, good news is we can skip this slide because Jan Werner covered this in his keynote brilliantly, so we don't have to talk about Schult Wern, Melier, Fritz Lang and so on, because what I like in Jan Werner's presentation is that he used a lot of reference to film. That's better. Kill this one. Okay, good. 
No? Yes? Maybe. Okay, good. So, thanks to Young Werner, we can skip this slide with references to, as I called it, pre-Apollo Luna works. But I want to look at this one because, uh, where's the laser actually? There. This one. Stanley Kubrick's 2001. As much as Mr. Werner used reference to film, keep in mind that the Apollo astronauts used 2001 as reference to describe how it was on the moon. Why is the moon interesting to contemporary art? I think at the moment we are in a very interesting, exciting time. Um, this little book here from Lukas Freireis, Memories of the Moon Age, is an incredible collection of what happened in the last 2,000 years in lunar art and exploration. So I recommend this highly. And there is this quote that the only thing that people, most people can recognize in the sky is the sun and the moon. That's true. And I found in the movie Spacewalker a quote which I like a lot. I don't know if this quote is right from Alexei Lenovov. It's taken from the movie. But astronauts can't be hobby artists, but artists can't be hobby astronauts. <laughs> I think this is changing now. And I would put hobby massively in brackets. Because we are in the time where we go from imagination to action. And space is not as unreachable as it was, thanks to all of you. Okay, let me run you through my top five contemporary artworks in connection to the moon and space. I only can scratch the surface of these works in my seven and a half minutes. And let's start with, of course, Alexandra Mir, the first woman on the moon, where she transformed a beach in the Netherlands with heavy machinery in a lunar landscape for one day and climbed it with a bunch of ladies to take pictures like on the Apollo landing. I put for everyone who likes to Google it instantly, always the web address from the works underneath. Two works which were massively impressive to me is Olafur Eliasson, The Weather Project, and Luke Jaren, The Museum of the Moon. What I like about both works is everyone who was at Tate Turbine Hall and saw Olias, uh, Olaf Eliasson's weather project, The Sun, will remember it. It was an overwhelming experience to be as close as possible to this space and get this feeling. The same thing with the seven diameter moon of Luke Jerem. I think a couple of you have seen it. I've seen pictures on... You had it as... Okay, good, perfect. So you, so you know it in detail actually better as I do. Still to me, one of the most wonderful poetic projects, Agnes Meyer Brandes, The Moon Goose Colony, where she raised a flock of geese according to the story of the man in the moon from James, uh, Francis Goodwin, where she crew geese and conducted astronaut training with them, and the geese lived on a lunar analog that is controlled through a um, control room. So if you have the chance to see this work somewhere in exhibition, she just had a show in Basel at House of Electronic Arts. If you have a chance to see this work, go and check it out. It's really wonderful. My favorite work ever, and I'm saying this now to Andy Crazy, I hope I get all information right to the webcam. Uh, if not, I do it as YouTubers do, leave comments in the section below. Um, Andy Crazy's Trosophila Titanus. To me, a master example of work for biological engineering, DIY work, and an artistic approach. What he did is he mutated fruit flies in a DIY process with a bike air pump, vodka, and I hope I get this right, um, smoke detectors to be able to live on Titan, one of the moons of Saturn. Why I'm showing this project? Because I think these are good examples for what Heinz von Förster calls systemic. Systemic as an attitude 
that sees, and I put the word again, art and science together again. Because what I think what happened in the last 2,000 years, or let's say since Leonardo or Galilei is, you went in your village, I went in my village. And we don't talk to each other enough anymore. And I think that should change. I think we should see art and science together again to spark inspiration. And why should we do this? Because that's something we need massively for this project is create space awareness in the public. I had a dentist appointment today, right now actually, which I had to postpone. And when my dentist asked me why I have to postpone this meeting, I said, I'm going to Strasbourg to give the talk at the international meeting for the Moon Village. And he said, is that a real reason to postpone a dentist appointment? <laughs> So, okay, at the end of my talk, you have to help me out with that one. <laughs> Let's look at my work. We colonized the moon, the second part of my talk. We colonized the moon is the name of my rock band, if you want to call it like this. It's my cooperation with the UK artist Sue Cork. Where's this name coming from? From an experience during an artistic residency, this is what artists do, we go on residencies, an artistic residency in an extreme environment in Norway. Here in the words of the curator Rob Lefrané from the Arts Catalyst in London, the Arts Catalyst in London organization who encourages and supports risk-taking art science projects like the work from Agnes Meyer Brandes and you crazy on my work. And we colonized the moon is seriously coming from these two pictures. It's like, we thought we never would work together. Sukok is a fine art printmaker. I'm a conceptual artist. And then we did one piece together, which was kind of like devastating and successful and good. This is why I'm here today. It's about the moon. Who guessed that? Um, let me demonstrate you quickly the work. And this is the first time I'm doing it this way. Abstract shape of the moon, rectangular, and I'm trying to place some of the work in the rectangular uh, area of that. And this is why I wanted actually the wireless mic. We can do this. Okay. No, no, that's okay, that's okay. So, um, that's an experiment. I like that experts like you like experiments and demonstration. Okay, I, I place an array of molecules right here. What we need now is an elegant and simple propulsion system to get them to you. And I'm trying to get the molecules as far as possible into the space. Okay, we're in the first two rows. How far are we now? Oh, over here. Uh, careful for the next speaker, it's a bit wet here now, don't split. <laughs> Okay, is something going in this, this direction? Yes? Yeah. Something in that direction? Oh, yeah. yeah? Okay, so let's get rid of, let's get, uh, rid of my elegant propulsion system. I think the molecules are now more or less everywhere in the space. What is it? Most of the people know it already, it's the smell of the moon. What is the smell of the moon? The Smell of the Moon is an art project I did with Sue Cork as we colonized the moon and it became one of our signature works. It's no secret, we did not do the smell. The smell was done for us by Steve Pierce, a leading aroma expert in the UK, commissioned by the Arts Catalyst, Fact Liverpool and Caro Werbeck from the Stedelijk Museum. And it started all with this very simple scratch and sniff card. So if you scratch the word moon, it smells like moon. 
This is something we did in 2010, which we will do again in 2019 for a bigger show in London at Greenwich Observatory. So we're doing next year a Kickstarter project, or we hope to do a Kickstarter project, to produce that piece from a fine art piece into a product for mankind to experience the smell of the moon. Good. Mostly in this point of my presentation, I like to see all these doubtful faces and ask, what is the smell of the moon? How did you do it? It's all based on oral history from the Apollo astronauts. Like this one, the, the taste of gunpowder and the smell of gunpowder from Charlie Duke, which is one of the best explanations of the smell of the moon. What is the smell of the moon? The smell of the moon is the dust in the spacesuits that the Apollo astronauts brought back to the landing module and the service module that reacted with the oxygen when they took off the helmets and what they experienced. After a couple of days back to Earth, gone. So in the end, we don't know much about the smell of the moon. Big question of you, is that confirmed? <laughs> Good news is, yes it is. <laughs> Who confirmed it? Buzz Aldrin, Edgar Mitchell, here are two quotes from Wired Magazine and AOL News. And both said it's similar to their own experience. Only Bob Jacobs from NASA tweeted that the makers of moon scratch and sniffs and a couple to our office and mine now smells like it has a fireplace. Simple answer, Bob Jacobs haven't been to the moon. <laughs> he has probably a fireplace at home. That brings us more or less to the end of my short presentation. Thank you for uh, listening. And now I have to ask you a huge favor. Where is my phone? Um, it's the thing with my dentist. Um, OK. As I have here this audience of experts, I would like to do it like this. OK. Um, Sorry, I had to postpone my dentist appointment today because I'm giving a presentation at the International Moon Village Workshop in Strasbourg. And I think, personally, that is important that we go back to the moon with all mankind. This is my opinion. Let's ask the experts. Do you think, do you think it is important that we go back to the moon for all mankind? Thank you. I hope this is enough reason not to be here this morning. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us and getting funding to what we wanted to do, like totally heat. Smells like gunpowder, too. Well, after seeing uh, and uh, smelling some of what we just have, uh, we get to go to uh, a more celestial uh, experience, and uh, we invite uh, Dr. Michael uh, Waltemath uh, forward, uh, a research associate in the Evangelical Theological Faculty of Ruhr University, Bochum. Please uh, welcome uh, Dr. Waltemath. Do we want to try that one? Yeah, it's your thing. Just, where does it go? Yeah. Like that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, you can. You're all looking at me. Um, now, what an introduction, right? As a theologian, it doesn't smell like gunpowder. It smells like hellfire. <laughs> I know, sin boldly, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about something completely different, religion and space exploration to you. Um, and l just let me begin by telling an, an anecdote. When, um, does that sound as strange to you as it sounds to me, my voice? Oh, that's great. When Apollo 8 flew around the moon on Christmas Eve, 1968, I wasn't even born then, 
the Apollo astronauts read from biblical scripture on their return to Earth. And they quoted the story of creation, and they read, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then um, Bill Anders actually blessed the population of Earth, which earned NASA a lawsuit. The uh, American Atheist Association sued NASA for using tax money of, to send a religious message from lunar orbit. And that went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And Jan Werner is going to be really happy to hear this. The Supreme Court rejected the case for lack of jurisdiction in lunar orbit. <laughs> so there is not much regulation up there. You'll, you'll be happy to hear that. But it had consequences. Oh, where's, the, where's the presenter thingy? Um, words. When Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong went to the moon. The first thing they did after having secured the land and made sure they would survive and would be able to return to Earth, Buzz Aldrin asked for a moment of silence and reflection. You can read that in the protocols there online. And um, then they read that text and celebrated Holy Communion on the surface of the moon. That was actually the first thing they did. So my point is, Religion has always been a part of the space program. Um, there's more. Some engineers got the idea that as Jim Irvine wanted desperately to take a Bible to the moon, but he burned Jim Irvine, Apollo 1, is that the correct astronaut? One of the Apollo 1 astronauts, the, those who perished in the fire, wanted to take a Bible to the moon. And later on, they decided, we will send Bibles to the moon. So they made these microfilm Bibles hundreds of them, send them. On Apollo 12, unfortunately, they put them in the command module. On Apollo 13, unfortunately, they didn't make it to the moon. And on Apollo 14, 15, 16, they sent about 450 of those to the surface of the moon and returned them to Earth, where they were given to dignitaries, religious people, and so on and so forth. The first religious artifacts returned from space. So they sort of added value to scripture by taking them to the moon and back, which is interesting. Also, if you have one of those, one just sold three years ago for $130,000, so they're really, really something. There's another Bible on the moon. Um, Dave Scott left that one on the lunar rover, so if you're going back up there, take some new batteries to drive the rover, somebody will find that Bible, which is an interesting connection between science and religion. It's a leather-bound Bible. It's been there for years now. You could take that back and check how far the ultraviolet radiation has penetrated the text, where it's gotten to, what it has erased. So you could actually use that as a science experiment, but it's also a great reminder of how much religion meant to these people. Actually, Dave Scott got away with quoting from the Bible, from the surface of the moon. He was reading from, oh, he was quoting out of his head, out of memory from Psalm 121. Nobody sued him for that one. So he's one of the last ones to do that. By the way, is this ESA sponsored? Because I just quoted from scripture, so oh, we should be good. <laughs> um, Today, Russian Orthodox priests regularly bless launches. That has been criticized as more of a political stand than a stand than a real religious action, which is doubtful. When astronaut Ilan Raman flew into space on the Columbia mission that eventually burned up in, during re-entry, he asked two rabbis how to live Judaism in outer space. And they found it, you can find that on the internet, the Institute for Space Halacha and discussed how to hold the Sabbath in low Earth orbit and so on and so forth. So not only Christianity, but Judaism is present. And when Sheikh Mushafa Masur, a Malaysian astronaut, flew to the ISS, he asked some religious scholars how to live his Islamic faith in space, and they wrote a religious ruling. One of the main questions, and I don't think I have the time to go into that here, was, um, which direction do you pray when you're in LEO? Okay, you can you can all appreciate the problem. And they found a, they found a rule from the history of Islam. But just to quote the astronaut, he said, "This is important to sort out because God wants adoration, not acrobatics." 
Okay, so obviously my point is religion is and was present in the space program, still is. This is a, um, is a laser, yeah. This is a Christmas celebration. And you can ask yourself how much religion is there in that, right? With the Santa hats and everything. But look at the back. There's a crucifix up there. There's a lot of religious items on the International Space Station now, and I think this will also be the case when we finally go and build a moon village. But there's something else. There's also religion that comes from space exploration. That soccer ball, I'm probably the only German in the room who is not even remotely interested in soccer, um, that soccer ball flew on Challenger, and it survived the explosion. And then 31 years later, they send it up to the International Space Station to finally get that ball into space, to give it a legacy, to give legacy to the people who perished on Challenger and also show it in front of Earth. Because the view of Earth is something that has been described by a lot of astronauts as a similar to religion experience, a spiritual, a religious experience. I'll just give you this picture, Hagen has already shown it, Earthrise. That was the picture that, in the words of the astronauts and in the words of the, um, the ecological movement, that basically started all that, that gave us the perspective from the outside. Suddenly we were, as humanity, able to look at our planet from the outside. Frank White coined the term the overview effect. And here's a brilliant example by Edgar Mitchell, what the overview effect means. I'm just going to um, point you to the um, last part of that quote. Religion does not only have a spiritual meaning, it also has a very real social and political meaning. You want to grab that politician by the scruff of his neck, drag him a quarter of a million eyes out, and say, look at that, you. So there is something that gives us an outside perspective from space exploration. Space exploration as religion, space exploration as spirituality, and you don't even have to go all the way out to LEO. It may be enough to look at the Earth from the outside and experience firsthand that this small blue band is what keeps us alive and kicking, and that it looks very fragile from the outside. Um, when the cupola module was added to the International Space Station. And you know that better than I do. It was designed to help steer this robot arm that's attached to it and perform that task. But I did a workshop last year at Brown University on building an inter international city on the moon. And the students in my workshop analyzed the data of what astronauts did in their spare time. And once Cupula was added to the International Space Station, their spare time routine changed. They suddenly spent a lot of time looking down to Earth. They have done that before, but now they had the perfect place. And guess what? The number of pictures of Earth multiplied immensely. The data stream is now much bigger concerning pictures of Earth. So there is something to that. Um, something to being able to look at the Earth from the outside that gets the uh, people who can do that to do that if they have the opportunity. So what does that mean for going to the moon? The artist Jorge Rubio, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, has proposed a plan for a temple on the moon, Teresa. Now here's the thing. That temple is going to be 3D printed sitting atop Shackleton Crater, and it will allow you to look back on Earth and reflect on Earth, but only for two weeks at a time. Because for the other weeks, you cannot see the Earth from that point on the moon, which I think is really, really important to have. If you want to have a lunar village, it puts an idea into a building, it reifies something, and that points back toward Earth, but it also stands on its own. So you need some point on the moon where you can look back at Earth, 
have that spiritual experience, but also have reflection on where you are at that point. I just want to give you the concept. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Yeah, I'm good, a couple of minutes. Um, I want to talk to you about reification. Reification means, and that is what you are or we will be doing when we are building a moon village. Reification means we are converting ideas into a concrete thing. We regard ideas as a concrete thing. And reification also means, and that's from Gestalt psychology, that's funny to speak German and English at the same time, um, reification also means perceiving things that are not there. So it's got three dimensions. You convert something into a concrete thing, you regard it as a concrete thing, or you perceive something in its absence. I want to give you an example from my field. That is a so-called Kanzelaltar, German invention after the Reformation. Um, it means this is where the Catholic priest would perform the sacrament of Holy Communion. And that is the pulpit where the preacher preaches the Word of God. Now the Protestants just put the Word of God above the sacrament to giving greater glory to preaching the Word of God. So this is the reification of a very Protestant notion within theology. And this is a Carthusian monastery. That's a monastery that aims at giving part of the monks that live in these little cells time to contemplate and reflect on their relation to God, on religion, on themselves, on the notion, on the, what's the word, on the, um, well, it doesn't matter, on the theology of the order, whatever you want to call it. And that, I think, is not only started in architecture as the first, the single family home, Right? This is, these are sort of individual monk cells, but they also look like detached housing or semi-detached housing. But this is also something that looks just like a space station. What you have here is the part that is secluded from the world, from the world and they are semi-autonomous. These monks, they have their house, and they also have their little workshop and they have their garden. So each monk can have his own vegetable, vegetables in the garden, can have a goat, do some work on tools and so on and so forth, but that's not enough. They fulfill their task of contemplation and they also fulfill their task of caring for themselves and having their own, growing their own food. But they also need support from the outside and sort of the airlock or the landing pad or the connection, that's the church here. That's where these monks connect to the outside world. So in every Carthusian monastery nowadays, there's roughly one, there's roughly 10 support people, 10 lay brothers per monk on the inside. I think the, the support ratio on the space station is, is um, worse than that, but maybe eventually you can get there. Um, so what I'm saying is, there's a brewery here. You can't have a brewery, individual brewery there, right? But there is something that is similar to a space station in religious architecture. And if you want to build a moon village similar to that, the question is, what's the mission? Why do they seclude themselves? What's the common worldview? So reification by a moon village is on the one hand, and this has been pointed out, a sense of community, but it's also a common worldview. Will it be science? Will these astronauts be monks of science up there, or will there be something else? Um, then there will be a defined social structure that is needed. What kind of social structure will a moon village have? Nowadays we have space missions that are very similar to military missions, chain of command and so on and so forth, but a village is different. There's a mayor. But a mayor is not a general, right? There's that difference. Also, there needs to be a communal support structure. A moon village cannot be easily independent of Earth. And it needs to have outside relations, which, by the way, are really important on Earth as well. If there's an international group up there, there's an international support group. So 
Having an international group up there will also help having an international group down here. And then there is the internal economy, and maybe we should touch that in the workshops later. What kind of economy will there be inside a moon village? What do these people have to exchange, right? The monks can exchange turnips against lettuce, but what can scientists exchange? Will that be the basis for interdisciplinary cooperation? And I think I rest, I stop with that and thank you for your attention. Thank you. And so now uh, the last uh, speaker uh, for our um, uh, presentations before our panel is uh, Kate uh, Arkless Gray. Uh, she studied genetics at the University of Cambridge before embracing a career as a radio producer and earning a broadcast uh, journalist uh, qualification from uh, City University. Uh, she's going to speak to us about uh, an extraordinary project for all moonkind. Uh, hello, and thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I just want to say I'm here on behalf of For All Moonkind. I'm wearing one of many different hats. Um, I also work with my colleague Torsten here for PT Scientist. Um, the slides I'm about to show you, I can't claim credit for the work here. They are done by Michelle Hanlon, who sadly can't be with us. Um, but I want to bring her into the room to triple the number of female speakers that we've had so far. Um, and on that note, I just want to say a quick word of thanks to uh, Dave Murrow from Lockheed Martin and uh, Mahesh, who was speaking earlier, for using the inclusive wording of humanity and human spaceflight instead of manned spaceflight. Um, I'm sort of looking around the room and there's just not enough females here for my liking. So it would be really great if we can all kind of take on more inclusive language and make sure that the Moon Village is indeed an inclusive, diverse place. So, you'll see here we're for all moonkind rather than for all mankind. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about the sustainable development of the Moon. But let's start. What do we even mean by sustainability? Space sustainability is defined as ensuring all humanity can continue to use outer space for pe peaceful purposes and socio-economic benefit, now and in the long term. This is a concept that we understand very well here on Earth. We've protected the terracotta army, we've rescued the ill-fated Vasa, and we've preserved dinosaur prints so that future generations can study, admire, and benefit from what came before them. World Heritage Sites have legal protection. Surely it makes sense that off-world heritage sites should also have such protection, but currently that's not the case. Now on the 20th of July, 1969, thousands, millions of people all around the world were glued to their TV sets and they were listening into the radio as humanity took its first steps on a different celestial body we finally managed to leave that metaphorical cra cradle. But this, of course, did not happen overnight. It didn't happen just because JFK declared, we choose the moon. This was based on hundreds, thousands of years of science, a huge scientific um, foundation that was built up from people all around the world. And nor are those first footsteps just the mark of the individuals that took them. They were just the tip of the iceberg, the public face of the work of thousands of people. For example, NASA engineer Ron Creel, one of many individuals who worked tirelessly day and night for a project that was bigger than themselves and didn't necessarily get the ticker tape parades that those people on the moon got on their return. The Apollo 11 mission represented uh, a hope for peace on Earth. 74 nations sent messages of peace on a dime-sized disk that was left at Tranquility Base. It's kind of proof that space unites, and that's way before the iconic handshake of the Apollo-Soyuz mission. Now, archaeologists sketch human evolution and our development 
with um, a range of, you know, as a sequence of key psychological and technological developments, overcoming our fear of fire, overcoming our fear of large stretches of water, developing language. Of course, taking steps on another celestial body is another key development for humanity. But unlike previous, previous giant leaps, this one, we actually know the time and the date that that leap was taken. Basically, it's an archaeologist's dream. No site on Earth is so pristine as the sites that we have on the moon. They're incredible, tangible examples of just how far we have come. But we're all here in this room to talk about the future, to talk about a moon village, not the past, right? Well, maybe this is a good time for us to pause and realize the value of Apollo, Lunacod, Chinese U2, China's U2 rover, and make sure that we don't do something that we later regret. I mean, sure, there are space treaties, but these do not cover the historic preservation or global, of global cultural heritage, although they do affirm that no nation can claim sovereignty. So I'm afraid if any of you were given a moon acre for Christmas sometime, it's not really worth the piece of paper it's written on. So Article 12 of the Outer Space Treaty does suggest that, sites, that states retain some control over stations, installations, equipment, and space vehicles. But if we take this to its extreme, does this mean that just by parking your rover there, you could claim that part of the moon? I'm not sure that's really in the spirit of the treaties themselves. So the question is, how are we going to prevent this? If you've been following the news recently, you might have seen that um, a Da Vinci painting at auction just was sold for $450 million. Now, I wonder what somebody would pay for this. <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> indeed. So, we feel like we need to do something to protect our global human heritage. Our suggestion for all mankind is a multilateral convention on the preservation and management of human heritage in outer space. There are legal precedents already available, for example, the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. They, we can't use that same thing for the moon because you can only nominate a site in your own territory. And as we've already established, nobody can claim that the moon is theirs. I mean, it's a nice idea, but who's gonna do it? This is where For All Moonkind comes into play. Founded by Tim and Michelle Hanlon, For All Moonkind is an international voluntary nonprofit citizen initiative. Uh, much like the Moon Village, it's still quite a young organization. I think it's been around for about four months, um, but we're you know, making great leaps and we'd like to invite you all to be part of the initiative here today. We have many different backgrounds, lawyers, marketers, communicators, scientists, engineers, but we have one shared goal and that's protecting the uh, valuable history that we have off the site of the world. So here's just a few of the team. That's uh, Tim and Michelle up on the left-hand corner there. And Michelle does send her apologies that she can't be with us today. So just recently, Michelle was in Dubai for the High Level Forum, and she gave them a challenge. She challenged them to recognize preservation as a sustainable goal, and they did. So today, I'm opening that challenge to you. We would like you to support for all mankind, and maybe I can suggest that you uh, make preservation one of your ITBCs for the Moon Village in your discussions later on. Now, if I just step over here and put my PT scientist hat on, we are the only organization that I know of who are actually actively looking at going back to an Apollo site at the moment. And I can proudly say that we are fully supporting for all mankind. And when we go back to Apollo 17, we will be doing so very respectfully and working closely in conjunction with NASA. In fact, currently there are some uh, lunar heritage guidelines which state that you should stay a certain distance away from the lander, there's a no-fly zone. But at the bottom of that, NASA also says, but if you happen to be going there, could you take these photographs and check this and that for us? So we'll be working closely with them so we can all learn um, from, from the uh, shared history of those that came before us. Uh, 
So, as uh, Newton once said, if I have seen a little further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. I just ask that we're just careful that we don't trample in their footsteps. Thank you very much. I think we have uh, five uh, panelists, right? Yes, five panelists. Right. Great. Yep, I think we're fine here. Okay, I think, do we have more than one microphone? We'll have another one. Okay, we've had uh, a substantial amount of uh, food for thought over the last uh, um, hour or so, and uh, what I would like to do is to break a little bit with the pattern and see if before I start asking questions of the panel, there are questions from uh, any of you, and we're off and running right up here. Yeah, there's one coming down, and then uh, we'll have another question. Bernard Fuang, I think, over here has a question. So this is this is for Kate. Um, are you proposing that we put a metaphorical fence around all of the landing sites and the lunar rover tracks that have been put on the moon uh, to keep away from a physical fence in deference to the moon village concept? So. Um, so we're a group of people with a bunch of different ideas, and the idea is that we come up with a combined way forward that protects things uh, for future generations. So what we currently have is just some guidelines from NASA, but those are only for the NASA sites. There was actually um, somebody suggested that the Apollo sites should become national parks, but that would mean that they are American, and that's 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 not what we want. We want to look after the shared you know, history from all of the different nations. Um, I guess it would be a case of just thinking carefully about what the value of each of the sites is and deciding whether it's something that we all as a, as a world, a globe, decide is, is worth saving for the future. And I would hope that that doesn't require physical or metaphorical fences. Um, but I guess that's, that's all open for discussion. So that would include the Lunacod sites and the U-2 sites and all, and all the other landers and rovers. Absolutely. Great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it raises a question I've heard posed elsewhere of whether it also includes some of the impact sites. You know, the, the original Ranger site, you know, just getting to the moon was an accomplishment. Uh, um, European impact sites, uh, obviously uh, several others. So it, uh, it will keep us occupied for some time and and I think maybe it's the thinking about this that's going to be a very important part of our planning with Moon Village. Uh, Bernard, I think you had a, a question. Yeah, well, on the challenges and opportunities looking towards the future of course. So we have heard about let's say 
uh, former science, former technology, former arts that were inspired by the moon, maybe in a nostalgic way. But uh, now, within the moon village, we have to be more disruptive to see how we put a new wave of, of effort together. And so, for instance, the uh, International Lunar Exposition Work Group started two years already uh, to launch the um, art prize competition. We had uh, also a class with various uh, art science schools. Um, you can see some of the posters uh, outside. Um, we, we had 30 art students that uh, uh, worked directly inspired by the Moon Village because this gives a new dimension. It's not only the Moon, it's how as a community we go there with all disciplines, uh, uh, from humanities to, to science, uh, with uh, all genders as well. And so um, I think we should uh, eventually at uh, MVA or in our splinter meetings look at a frame where we could launch for instance, an art initiative, a multicultural initiative that will be really directly linked with Moon Village, inspired by the new dimension of uh, uh, Moon Village. So what do you think about it and how could you contribute? So the question, uh, if we actually build a, uh, an aesthetically focused, artistically focused mission, uh, uh, how would you think that would flow or how would you contribute to such a mission? Yeah. Uh, yesterday in our first work group session, which was actually uh, focusing on technical aspects, like my first idea was to create, this is what we have in the art world, we have residencies. As an artist, you go, in a certain age, you go to residencies where you meet other artists, exchange, experience different environments, cultures, and so on. And out of these residencies, mostly the most amazing projects come because they change quite often the way artists look at things and work. So my suggestion was instantly, we should have a uh, kind of like a residency in the framework of the lunar village. The lunar village starts here now, right now on Earth. And then at some point there will be probably a place on the moon where we can go and send people. But I think as sooner as you can get arts into the whole process, as better it is and as more interesting it is. So I agree with Bernard is yes, go in this direction, encourage people to work in this field, because I think it will be a new time and a new form of art that is generated through these possibilities that come up in the close future, in the near future. Yes, Paul. Um, I happen to be a member of the IA study group, which is called From STEM to STEAM. And in STEAM, A stands not for anything, but for art, specifically. And uh, uh, I can tell you that within the framework of this study, uh, which is uh, very multinational, we are looking at different uh, possibilities of how to uh, use, for example, imagination of the students from the secondary schools or from very uh, famous artists like Alexander Mir, for example, uh, who is aware of this study group um, elaborations uh, for uh, advancing uh, our understanding of how we proceed in particular with Moon Village. And uh, what I'm going to do, Bernard, is uh, to bring uh, the ideas of produce here at the workshop, for example, and wider by MBA uh, to the study group attention. And we will try to see how we could contribute by our joint forces to this. Great. Hagen, I'd actually be intrigued if, if you actually had the opportunity to spend um, um, two weeks on a lunar base. I mean, you're a conceptual artist. What kinds of things might you be thinking of trying to do that you haven't been able to do of? I can't tell because I think the experience to be in such an environment would be so overwhelming that it would produce, would reproduce or produce results that are out of the framework I can imagine at the moment. I can imagine what it will be on the moon. I can look at the images from the moon, but the experience to be there will be something different. This is why I showed these two pieces from Olaf Eliasson and the Moon Project, which are experiences. So I would be thrilled to go, even if I would be hell scared to do this, 
with the whole risk, I would do it for the price of being able to get the experience and turn it into something that I could give back and create something out of that. So looking for surprise and the serendipity of surprise. Serendipity is, especially in my work, but in a lot of artists' work, a huge driving element. And I think the possibility to be out of this place and experience it from that perspective would be one of the most thrilling serendipity possibilities that are thinkable at the moment. Right. Mahat? Yeah, I think I would like to share one of my recent experience in this sort of topic area. Um, so I told my colleague here that I was recently having a discussion with the artist Andy Gracie, who was mentioned uh, before. And after talking to him like for 10 minutes, after that we kind of started discussing so many things that I didn't go in that meeting, I don't think he came in that meeting thinking that we would be discussing that. And often what I find is actually you need a platform or a place where people from different disciplines could actually come together just to start talking. You cannot predict what the outcome would be, but all you can do is you can put people in one place coming from different directions. And that I find most exciting. Otherwise in my daily life, you know, I'm so stressed, I'm so lack of time for doing the science that I'm doing, I'm so focused that I don't have time to think about other things. But I would like to talk to somebody. So if the Moon Village Association workshop kind of platform becomes available where people like us can come together and talk, I'm very sure that there will be outputs that we do not yet know. But they will take us into many different directions and positive directions. Michael? Oh, I'm oh. sorry. I just want to add, I work in Stuttgart with a place called Akademie Schloss Solitude, which is an international art residency. It's a baroque castle on top of the hill. It's a residency for 25 to 35 artists. Not only artists, it's all disciplines. It's going from fine arts, work composition, architecture, philosophy, even they had a stipend for chess. And this is, uh, these places are melting points because disciplines come together. And every time when you go to lunch, there is lunch altogether, is this is where people meet and start talking in an easy, loose way. And out of these places, this is are the places where the really most interesting projects steam from and come from. So I think Moon Village has exactly this potential to, to create this like melting pot of disciplines to bring people together. Okay. Just a, just a short or two short notions. Um, number one is the um, what I think could be a problem is that what, what we're doing is trying to do interdisciplinary work and there needs to be understanding, fundamental basic understanding of what the other side does, right? I'm saying we're talking, but do I really understand what the scientist does? Does the scientist understand the theologian? So um, I would be. I, would, I, I just want to caution that that this interdisciplinary work often goes down the drain when you don't know what you're talking about on the other side. So I think there is a great need for that discussion to keep this on a high academic level and not just have it go somewhere else. And uh, the number two thing, Bernard, how about a theologian in residence somewhere at Estec? I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Also to integrate theologian artists in real crew team. From the, I have artists, I have theologian, but I give them also technical tasks. They have to operate spectrometers. They have to talk with the medical doctor and the reverse. Yeah. And then on the vi Moon Village, we will acquire this very broad uh, interdisciplinary skills as well. I'm, I'm, I've been I've been discussing that with a couple of people. Just imagine sending a group of humanities students to an analog research station on Earth. It would, it would, on the one hand, help solve protocol issues for the uninitiated, and on the other hand, it would give a totally new perspective to that one. That would be a great project. Excellent, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure the ISU students here who've been through uh, team project work will identify with your interdisciplinary complexity problem. It's, uh, uh, I'm sure none of you have ever had a conflict in any of your team projects. It's, uh... <laughs> 
<laughs> so, um, are there other questions from the audience? Yes. Can I? Sorry, wait, can I wait. just chip in on that last point? Because uh, I actually have some practical examples. Like we're, we've got a lot of discussion here, but um, I actually want to totally disagree with something you just said about keeping everything on a highly academic level. I think it is our duty to ensure that we open this out to a lot more people and stop being snobbish and using really long words that nobody else understands. I, I think you know it really needs to be engagement with with things and. So uh, a part-time scientist, PT scientists, I'm, I'm head of communications there. So of course, this is something close to my heart. Um, so Mission to the Moon is something that we want to create a new Apollo moment by kind of returning to Apollo, but bringing a new generation on, on board and bringing them along with us. And that doesn't just mean scientists. We do have scientists. Um, we do have interdisciplinary partnerships. Our two key technology partners are Audi, and Vodafone. These are non-traditional space partners. So there's been some kind of discussion that, oh, we should bring these people in. We're doing it. We're already there. We are being disruptive. Um, we're taking art with us. We're in conversations with an artist who is wondering about actually creating art with one of our rovers in the, the lunar regolith. Um, we have various projects that we're taking with us. And we are, of course, small plug here, more than happy to take your payload for mm -hmm. a very reasonable price if you'd like to fly with us. Is there a lawyer in the room that would like to defend the international, of the intellectual property of that rover? Uh, yes, here we, here, here we go. There's somebody. Uh, Irmgar. Of course, it's a topic of public international law and space law. What about uh, the protection of the moon heritage sites? Uh, classically, um, it's sort of, it, they have the unilateral or the multilateral approach. And I, I, I see that there are scientists and there are several initiatives to try to follow the multilateral approach, to try to propose it to UNESCO in some way, because this would be a forum, an international forum, which of course has yet not yet sort of the task um, and scope of action on the moon, but it can it's, it decide so. So it would be a body, an international legitimate body to do so, to declare from now on, also UNESCO would look at the moon. There is no obstacle to that because the international community organizes itself. Um, for the unilateral approach, you have well, it's more difficult because there is no national jurisdiction on the moon. So NASA can only be kindly asked, please protect, do not run over our sites. Uh, but uh, there is some um, sort of an understanding. Thank you very much. Uh, we will try to do our best, but there is no legal protection for that. The legal protection is only confined to the space objects themselves. So there is still property of the NASA landers. And so on the moon, they, are be they belong still to NASA. And this has to be respected and is respected under the treaties, but not an area around and surface and so on. So we still, there is the ongoing discussion how, how to go forward with that, unilateral, multilateral. Okay. There's a question here, and so then we've got some more. The is trying to go via the um, via UNOSA, so it's a UN route, but not UNESCO. And another thinking is obviously like UN things and multilateral agreements take time. So uh, they're looking at getting uh, space businesses to sign up to a kind of self-policing agreement that you know we wouldn't go and destroy things. Um, and PT scientists would be certainly happy to support that. And there is some argument that the not to interfere clause uh, provides some protection. Um, whether the interference has to be contemporary or not is not decided. But you know. So, okay, well, so here, right so, here. So he brought me the mic, so I right. Guess this I'll is good. The mic gives power. <laughs> I, I wanted to uh, ask a question that you all probably have an individual um, point of view on um, from a different different position. Um, which is where on the moon would we choose a site? What would be your preferences? From the first discussion, we might pick a site with the um, best possibility of finding water. Uh, from the religious point of view, we might find a site with the best possible view of heaven. Uh, from the artistic site, we might find another view. So I just wanted to ask your uh, opinions on what site would you choose and how should we go about? Because we will have to pick one spot to put the first things down. How would we go about picking that? Okay, all right. 
Well, I can at least try to use some of the science arguments which might drive the selection of sites. And I believe that that will also play a role in sort of ticking the box from other considerations too, right? Uh, I don't believe that we are at a position at the moment to say this is the site we want to go because this is a second level problem to me. The, the first level problem is that there has to be an ultimate desire that we have to go to the moon. So the vision has to be there, the commitment has to be there, and that has to be agreed whether it is going to happen by one space agency or international cooperation, whatever. First, let's establish that. So, okay, so we want definitely to go to the moon. The purposes could be very different, so if we are going there for ultimate resource utilization, then we have to first understand what are those resources. Do we understand them? I don't think so. Yes, we need water, but as I said, we don't yet know in what form that water may be present. How much is it there? Is there any other way of producing water elsewhere on the moon where actually right now we don't see water as water ice? So we can do some technological development here on Earth to take with us, in which case the site selection that may be constrained by the presence of that water ice is suddenly gone, right? So I think we are not there yet, and I think it, it will be too soon to start discussing about this would be a preferential site over the other, whereas what we should be doing is trying to understand right now at a much greater detail, a much greater level, yeah, what is out there on the moon how different things can be utilized, what are the different parameters that will play a role in siting a base. You know, temperature, vacuum, solar wind, cosmic ray radiation, micrometeorite impact, availability of water. What we want to do from the moon, is it radio astronomy we want to do, or is it, you know, uh, building roads and paths and launching rockets? So I'm afraid it's not a, a simple answer, but a lot of consideration. Ali? I would completely share this view. Uh, we should first uh, formulate criteria for the selection of the site and maybe uh, to have some weights for each criteria and uh, to come uh, to a conclusion uh, collectively, inevitably, since we are an association, and uh, to decide in, uh, indeed whether it should be far side, for example, because there are some very strong arguments in favor, as you know, for example, Radio astronomy was mentioned, or uh, from technological point of view, how we should extract some useful resources, etc., etc. Great, Michael, do you have a comment there? Okay, okay because you said the view of heaven um, is often said that religion is most important at the end of life. Let me just say we don't want to force the issue. So, um, <laughs> if you if you want to place a village on the moon. Um, all these these notions that I just presented to you, they are I think they are vital thought experiments. What happens if you go to that place in in a spiritual sense? If you have if you see the earth and then you don't see it, what what's the what's the the, the cultural and the um, and the um, the intrinsic notion that stems from that view? You probably will not be able to see heaven. There's a high probability that you will not be able to see that. But I would agree that that. We need some more science to understand where we want to go, but we also need to ensure that people can actually live there and prosper, right? That is one of the fundamentals that, that is necessary. And everything else is just a really, really interesting, and I also think vital thought experiment, what's the mission of that village? So great, so we, we're gonna take two more questions. I think the mic is up there, if I'm understanding correctly. And then we have a question here that's been very patiently waiting from almost the beginning. So, well, I, you know, we're I running out of time. Okay, I've seen the mic delivered up there, so if... Uh, okay, I have a mic here, so I'll start. Uh, so this question's on... Yeah, here. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, there's this question of the late heavy bombardment and, and probably uh, investigating the... the the origins of life on the Earth. Uh, what, what sort of priorities do, do do we need to put in for the the Moon Village in in case uh, we, we had to prioritize such sites and would we have to protect certain places which which probably are going to give us more evidence from uh, f 
from field work, probably sample collection, that suppose suppose they are the same sites that you want to use for uh, prospecting and for in situ resource utilization. Would you want to prioritize access to such sites uh, that they are first they first help confirm such in hi certain hypotheses, and then we go ahead with commercial exploitation? So. Prioritization of sites based on scientific value or other perceived value of the site for something other than commerce. Uh, what's your what's your sense about that? This all again comes down to what we understand by Moon Village. Um, I slightly struggle with it being quite such an open concept. I like at least something to hang my ideas off. So I'm going to just go back to what we can achieve. And I think our limitations at the moment are what can we do? Um, currently, we're, you know, it's a great thought experiment, but now we need to go to the next stage and actually get to the moon. Um, so for us, our priority is showing that we can get there and land safely and um, do some proof of concept of like communications technology. And then from that point on, if we can create like navigational beacons to allow more um, accurate landings, then I would say somewhere like the South Pole would be a great place to go. But the, the key thing is like, what can we actually do? And what is going to, where's the money? Like, no bucks, no buck rogers. So if we're going to do this, we have to find uh, a business model in order to do it. Now, we think that we have one at PT Scientists. Um, but obviously, that's going to depend on us proving our technology and then seeing that there's a market there. So we'll go wherever the market wants us to go. Okay, Mahesh. So I think uh, going back to the question that was asked with regard to the understanding the origin of the life and the late heavy bombardment, etc. I think we are conflating two very different things here. Okay, the commercial operation or exploitation, what we are talking about, in some sense, if the exploration can happen tomorrow the commercial exploration probably will happen in 50 years. So that's the kind of time difference we are talking about. First of all, we have to explore. Yeah? And to address lots of science questions, you have to first get there to see what is there. And once humans are there, or you know, many argue that you can do something robotically as well, or you can combine the two, you will find things that will be part of that exploration which will then address those fundamental science questions. And trust me, I can tell you all about the solar system, even from a grain that may be a millimeter or less, if it is the right one. The question is how to get the right one, and nobody knows that. And don't also forget that exploration can very easily be combined with commercial work. So lots of mining activities that's going on on Earth right now Regularly, a lot of science is coming out from those mining activities because scientists are involved in that and they're always finding new things. So I don't think these two things are separate. Mm. But first it has to be exploration that will then, you know, in, in a way, guide where we go and, and do the commercial activity. So it's not a problem. Okay. I think it's, it's a stepwise process that we need to follow. Okay. Question right there. Great. Right. Hiya. Uh, thank you for your time. This this panel's been actually really, really interesting because of the like it's a bit of a more diverse view than what you get normally. Um, a couple of observations about uh, religion and world heritage sites and temples. This kind of goes beyond like just building a moon base. Like this is building a settlement. This is like actual infrastructure for a settlement. It's, like permanent residence there. I am having some trouble hearing you. I don't know if it's the mic or... Yeah, can speak more loudly there? That's okay. better, yes. There we go. So yeah, the fact that we're talking about temples and world heritage sites sort of points to it being more of a... Yeah. It being more of a settlement. Yeah. And not just a base. <laughs> Now, I don't think uh, the other observation is that the role of religion in this is a non-zero factor because most of the, the people in, on Earth are religious. Um, so what do you think 
the role of things like the overview effect, which is this just powerful effect to where you can see yourself as part of a system that contains all of humanity. How do you see that precipitating a move away from religious dogma towards a more holistic view of like world religion and like just a form of spirituality as part of a system? There we go. There's a dissertation. Yeah. Um. <coughs> I'm, I'm afraid, I, have, I, I think I, I want to disappoint you, I need to disappoint you. Um, on the one hand, yes, there was this moment when it first came up, when it got this holistic vision of we will protect the earth and the environmental movement is strong as ever. But when you look at the history of religion or at the, at the current state of religion, there is this wide variety of religions that differ in dogma, that, that differ in faith. And that sort of coexists. So, um, if that is a holistic vision that has to do with it, I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. But on the other hand, I think that there's always going to be separate groups that need to that feel the need to distinct their own group from the others. But uh, we haven't had the overview effect in as popular a, a vision as it was in the 1970s for for decades now. So we can't really say, well, I can't really say what's going to happen. Just think about the um, when you when you think about the overview effect and the um, the copies of it. So when Apollo eight took that picture, Earthrise, and then uh, Carl Sagan had Voyager, Voyager two, turn around and take that same picture from the orbit from Saturn. It's it and it was a very very small the, that pale blue dot. And then they did the same thing with Cassini, same picture better resolution, it just didn't have the same power, although you saw the same thing. So maybe maybe that's a different notion that we need to purvey at this time. Maybe going out there and having religion transform itself on another celestial body will give enough perspectives to that. Right. Excuse me? Yeah, sure. So the question is coming on the practical side. Uh, it's of course, as an association, we, one of the main goal is to reach out the public. And as I said yesterday in trying to explain what the association is trying to do, is to get on our same page a uh, non-space organization. And in particular, I'm thinking about the environmental organization, which are extremely penetrating in the public. So the question to the public, uh, to the panel, excuse me, is could you give us some lead how to try to approach uh, non-space uh, organization, and in particular environmental organization, uh, so that the next, in a year time, uh, apart from uh, all these wise uh, scientists uh, and technologists and whatever, that we really will have uh, a strong uh, participation of non-space organization which could then have a multiplier effect uh, in the society in spreading the news and try to gain uh, let's say the public uh, and therefore uh, the politicians so the cycle that uh, we need to start so is there any concrete suggestion now or uh, in the session there is a breakout session three so i don't want to take more there is a breakout session three which will deal with this so could I please ask uh, the master as well as uh, the people in the, in the breakout session three maybe to come with some concrete uh, proposal so that we could follow up. And then the final comment is as far as uh, the uh, establishing uh, a place where dialogue can take place, uh, we already have an existing Slack uh, way of uh, communicating between members uh, of the association. Uh, it is very easy for us uh, uh, to open up a thread uh, which is related to cultural aspect and uh, even sub-thread where basically artists uh, or other people could communicate uh, uh, basically in real time and that is a platform that the association can uh, immediately offer and maybe we're going to take this as a part of, uh, of the conclusion. Thank you.
So, I mean, I think to some extent we have reached our time. We do have a challenge then to the breakout group on science uh, and, um, uh, and uh, culture. And I think that means that uh, we have gotten to that remarkable time when you get uh, some coffee as a reward for being such a good audience. Thank you very much. I will just, uh, I will just note that we are 17 minutes past our time when we were going to take the break. And you're, in principle, the breakout sessions that were just alluded to are supposed to start in about 12 minutes. So let me urge you to go ahead and, of course, get your coffee and do some networking, but then proceed to the breakout team rooms that you were in yesterday afternoon and get the conversation started. Thank you. John, the uh, program said 10.45. Well, I'm sorry. The one they gave to all of us was 10.45. I'm, I'm, I'm getting tired of these, ex these surprises. Thank you.